So before we get started with the presentation, um, I want to acknowledge that uh, most of us are here living in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and there may be a few who live in different uh, unceded territories. Um, today, uh, the day before uh, St. Patrick's Day, we have uh, a presentation on Ireland, quite appropriate, by someone who is Irish, so Irish that I didn't know how to pronounce your name until a few minutes ago, but uh, it's Neve uh, Kelly. Did I get it right this time? You did, you did, Paul. <laughs> good, good, good. And she's going to tell us about uh, all about Ireland. And I've asked Neve to say a few words of introduction about herself and then proceed with the presentation. So Neve, perhaps you could share your screen and then you can say a few words about yourself and we'll get going. Um, okay, so share screen. Well, and while Neve is doing that, I would like to ask everybody to please mute themselves so that we don't get feedback. And I'm going to make this big. I'm going to go to speaker. So I'm assuming, Paul, you can now see my screen, yeah? I can see your screen perfectly. And I can see you. I put you on one side of it so you will come out recorded as a speaker. Excellent. So, um, so to introduce myself, as Paul said, my name is Neve Kelly, and I do have a slide further along that'll show you how you get uh, Neve out of N I A M H. Um, <laughs> and I did all of my degrees, including my PhD at uh, Trinity College Dublin, and I left Ireland in 1985 and came to postdoc in microbiology with Bob Hancock. And then I was hired back into the Faculty of Medicine in 1990, I think, as an assistant prof. And I stayed out my professorial days in medicine and retired in 2020. So that's my background. Um, so I'll launch right in. Um, so I'm going to try and sort of introduce Ireland to you uh, in a myriad of ways and, and practically to um, sort of indicate how you can choose to set up a holiday there, if you like. So to start with, the um, island of Ireland, which is, of course, the last sort of country on the edge of Europe, next stop America, hence the large number of Irish in America. And it is divided into four provinces. And so apart from the fact that it is a sort of a division of the island geographically, it is extremely important if you ever find yourself at any sort of sporting event in Ireland, because everybody plays for their province, and also historically has huge importance. Um, if you've ever heard of the saying beyond the pale, the pale was um, so three, I think it was three of the counties in Leinster, where at one stage the Irish managed to contain the English and saw the rest of the country as Irish and those three, three counties as English. So, so, and Ulster, which I'll come on to explain to you, you will probably have heard a lot about over the last decades in the news. But before I bring you further in and explain the counties, which I have here, I want to bring give you a little bit of our sort of myth, mythological background, which again is, is province-based. So now I'm going to have to move this. Um, oh, that's better. So before we were a colony and before St. Patrick brought the, the church in to rule us, we actually were um, a very proud uh, Catholic, or sorry, very proud Celtic island with clans, kings and queens. And the kings and queens in the in the Celtic system were chosen not by lineage necessarily, but by their feats. And um, one huge clan was called the O'Neills, or the O'Neills of Ulster. And they had amongst them a lineage that included two of the high kings of Ireland. So we, we would have high kings, and then there were kings and queens of those various provinces. One of the more famous is Queen Maeve, uh, who was Queen of Connacht. 
And she was uh, the enemy and former wife of Krahur. That's how you pronounce that rather difficult looking word there. That's Krahur Magnessa, who is the king of Ulster. And she is best known for starting um, a rather uh, long, drawn out, heroic fight called Ton Bo Cooling, which is the cattle raid of Cooley. And it was her aim to steal Ulster's prize stud bull, Don Cooling. And so along with the clans and the queens and, and kings of Ireland, um, Ireland, as I'm sure most of you know, has a rich mythology. And for any of you that are into it in a very academic way, there's a book called The Complete Irish Mythology by Lady Gregory, with a preface by W.B. Yeats, and um, it goes through the main sagas. There is um, a much easier to carry, if you want to take it with you when you're going to Ireland, Penguin Classics, Early Irish Myths and Sagas. And three of the big heroic stories, and, and these stories were originally, remember, oral stories. So they're, they sort of go on and on, as the Irish are wont to do when they're telling a story. And they involve all the usual um, ins and outs of a heroic journey type of story. And in some ways, Cúchelan, for instance, so that the one I mentioned that Maeve was involved in, Thornbo Cooling, which is the cattle raid of Cooley, it's the central text in a cycle of epics called the Ulster Cycle that follow Cúchelan. And Cúchelan is really the sort of archetypical hero in the Irish uh, sagas. And then there's a love story of Dermot and Grania that, of course, is involved because Dermot was actually supposed to be marrying Finn McCool, who was about 50 years older than her. But it, or sorry, Grania was, but instead fell for the younger Dermot. So that's um, a love story with plenty of shenanigans and fights going on. And that's from a cycle of epics called the Fianna cycle. And then my own name comes from Tirnanog. And Tirnanog is the land of eternal youth, which really is from the Celtic other world and, and involves um, a sort of a, a group, if you want, more than a clan called the Tua de Danon. And Neve, um, Neve was from the land of eternal youth, so Neve never dies, which I'm, I'm sure uh, I haven't inherited that part. And again, there's a sort of a love story there with Ashin. So I, I introduce with the with these mythologies and kings and queens just to remind you that before we were a colony and before we were under the uh, the rules of the Catholic Church, we we have a very rich history. So now let's take a look at the counties. I, as I said, there were four provinces. We've got Ulster up here in the north, Connacht in the west, Munster in the south, and Leinster in the east. <clears throat> Pardon me. And Ulster is, again, it's it's a, a province. The provinces predate the separation of our country into the Republic of Ireland, which is these green 26 counties, and the north of Ireland, which is these six, which uh, are under the rule of Britain. And the rest of it is under the rule of, of our government. And obviously the biggest thing now, as I'm sure you've all followed, the 26 counties are part of the EU and the six counties are not. But in case you mistake, because sometimes in the in the news they will call this Ulster, the province of Ulster actually is the six counties that are of lighter colour, plus Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan, those three which are, are in the Republic. So Ulster is, is um, as I say, a province on the island beyond, beyond extending beyond just the six counties that encompasses the north. So I'm going to take you through, while I will um, indicate some other holidays one's can, one can take in different parts of the country, my photos are mostly from the places that I tend to hang out when I go home, and I do go home every year. And so I'm going to start with Wicklow, which is the county, which is called the, the Garden of Ireland. It's... Um, um, I mean, the whole country is green, but it's got a lot of sort of, uh, I guess, more... Um, tame garden-like uh, scenery. And then I'm going to later take you across to where my heart is, which is in the west of Ireland, which is more the boglands, the boglands of Connemara. Okay, so to start with, before I take you down my favorite places, 
Um, if you want to plan, uh, if and when you're planning your own holiday, you would probably find it worthwhile going to the Ireland.com site, which is um, our, if you like, national tourist site, which you can see they're getting ready for tomorrow. Um, and there, if you go to destinations, you can look at a variety. You perhaps we'll come to the site already knowing where you want to go. If not, you can entertain yourself, preferably with a glass of Guinness in hand, um, in sort of exploring different parts of Ireland. So you can see here, there's some of the cities. And um, on this main page here, they've got um, some ideas like Ireland's hidden heartlands, the north of Ireland, the wild Atlantic way. So, and there's many other um, riches to explore on this site. There's the things to do and they can break it down into, for instance, we one time we were back did a, a Game of Thrones tour. And there's, as you can see on the site, there's walking and cycling in Ireland. And, um, oh no, my ball is, Okay, the colored ball was going around. Then there's how to plan your trip. Oh, this is going to be so annoying. The colored ball has appeared. Okay. Um, so, so some of them are um, on the extreme west is the Wild Atlantic Way. And that's the Connemara area that I go to. And they've now developed um, either you could walk it or, or cycle it. They've developed whole routes along the west coast of Connacht. There's the northern route, which is the causeway coastal route, which can take you to the Giants Causeway. And as I said, there's a Game of Thrones tour. You could do a Lakelands tour, which would take you along the longest river in Ireland, which is the Shannon, and take you, which would be more like if you want a, a car journey, or you can go along the Shannon on, um, on river barges. And just um, as an indication, because this, I think this tour is, if, if you choose to do it, and as I say, it could be a self-guided, would be about five hours. And so to get from the southernmost part, part of Ireland to the northernmost only takes you about eight hours. So, you know, it's a pretty small island in, you know, where I think when I left, we were three and a half million, I think, in the Republic and five million, I think, if you included the north. I suspect we're up to four million now in the Republic. There's also down south, the Ring of Kerry, um, which is um, a very beautiful, in my opinion, just more a tamer part of the country where it's soaring mountain passes and charming towns. I personally prefer the wilder uh, west and north of the country. And then there's Ireland's ancient east where you can really follow that original history of ours through to Christianity arriving. Um, there's a fabulous burial site, which I think is around the same time as Stonehenge. Um, I'm, I'm a scientist, so, so dates and history is, is not my strong point, but it's called Newgrange. Um, there's some early Christian sites, such as Tom McNoise, the Rock of Cashel, which is medieval buildings, and talks about the um, Patrick bringing Catholicism to Ireland. This is just before I move on, uh, a picture of those ballast uh, stones at, at the Giant's Causeway. So now I'm gonna take you first through um, my photo shoot of Wicklow, which is a place that I usually will go when I go home before I go to Connemara. And so, so you'll see when I go through both Wicklow and, and Connemara, in truth, it doesn't matter where you go in Ireland, you choose it for the reasons you wanna choose. It's all a play out really of hills, uh, obviously a lot of green rocks, water, either in lakes or a lot of the time with the ocean. And um, you can see here lots of waterfalls. And then this is, remember, this is Wicklow. So this is the Garden of Ireland. So this was taken in June, if I remember, when I was back the, the last trip before COVID. So you can see some of the colors of the flowers. And what I love here is um, in Wicklow, there's um, a woolen mills that's very well known for its textiles. It's called the Evoca Mills. And 
here's um, when I was traveling, I, I stayed in Wicklow for a few days and traveled around. And so when I went to the Avoca Mills factory site, here is the colors of their threads and some of the, the textiles are making chairs, um, obviously a lot of shawls and blankets. Here's a beautiful um, shawl type scarf. And here's a picture of the surrounding countryside. So for me, I, I see a lot of the countryside picked up in, in these textiles. So if you choose to go, um, you can construct any number of type of holidays. Um, a friend of mine who's in physiology, Caroline Cornea, she has gone um, twice with this company called TaylorMade Tours on walking and hiking tours. She's done both the Wicklow Way, which I've just introduced you to some of the scenery there, and she's done the Burren Way, which is in County Clare on the West Coast. And um, basically they set it all up for you with um, bed and breakfast and places you have your dinner and you just put on your hiking shoes, they move all your gear from place to place and you hike in one direction. And she highly recommends the company and said they're really easy to work with. And so even though I don't have a direct link, there is the, um, the URL for them. And um, I have one set of friends who biked in Ireland. They didn't recommend the company they were with. Um, as you can imagine, with both walking and biking in Ireland, the problem is, which I'll detail in another slide, is that it rains in Ireland all the time, which is why it's such a green country. But if you do want to plan a biking holiday, um, there is another site, as well as Ireland.com, there's Discover Ireland. And I found that they have, um, no, I thought... They have, if you go there, they, they yeah, cycling, let's see. They, they've laid out quite a few cycle trips and different ways as to how you can set them up. So down here, they've got, some of these are just day, day cycles, if you wanted to do a day cycle. I know this is one I want to do, the Great Western Greenway. Um, and also, if you go to, to their site, the, I do believe they've set up um, cycling holidays. And then recently, somebody drew to my attention this um, really interesting article that came up on a site called BBC Travel. And it only came out in November. And so it's an article about a bike path that's only being developed so it's you can't sort of organize it as a bike trip there's no accommodation set up so but the article details where you could rent a bike and how you would set it up for yourself and the thing about Connemara is it's um a lot of these roads are what we call boreens which is an Irish term which really means just um, a very narrow pathway through the bogs. And so the writer of the article pointed out how you're just immersed in the scenery if you choose to set this up for yourself. And he did, as I say, give quite a bit of detail of where he stayed and where he rented his bike. So I personally, and the other point of Connemara is it's quite a flat route. So I personally am thinking of trying to do that for myself. So that's if you choose to go biking or walking. Um, what I tend to do when I go back is I um, either rent a car or use the railways, and I'll come on to that, and I buy myself the appropriate maps. So this site is called, it's the Ordnance Survey, uh, OSI, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland site. And if you go there, you can, they detail a series of maps. This is the Ireland series. And so they have huge road atlases, which if you were going to do a major driving tour around Ireland, you'd want. There's the Dublin range, if you're mostly hanging out in Dublin. There's a holiday series, divide, which divide the island into north, south, east, and west, and give you lots of detail. There's city series, if um, as well as, uh, as Dublin or other than you choose to hang out more in Galway or Kerry or one of the other cities. Now, this is the one I love. So this is the Discovery series. It divides the country into 90 sections and it's um, one in 50,000 um, in terms of how it's laid out. Um, I think that's one centimeter 
map to 50,000 um, of roadway. So when I first started to bring, my husband um, was Canadian, never been to Ireland before he met me. And when he first came back, he was the one who discovered these and we would only ever drive the back roads and it was so much fun. So I highly recommend if you're going to hang out in a specific part of Ireland. So for instance, now I have about three or four of these that detail different parts of Connemara. And so they detail it. So whether you're even for walking, if you're just hill walking, you'll be able to find all the routes in these. So I highly recommend the Discovery Series. And then there's an Adventure Series for hill walking cyclists. And I did explore, you can buy them online and you could ship them to Canada. Um, I can't remember how much the maps are, but the shipping's about 20 euro. Um, and I didn't look in, into the fact of if you buy more than one, whether that's one price or or it goes up. But um, I would highly recommend, particularly the Discovery Series, if you're going to concentrate in, a, in a, one specific area of the country. So this was, uh, this is just detailing them. Okay, otherwise, how do you get around the country? Um, and how do you get there? So the first thing is, if you go anytime from the end of May to the end of September, and I always go for the month of June, because as I said, it can rain any time in Ireland, and but it's almost guaranteed these last few years to rain here. So I escape the rains here. And an answer to when is, oops, sorry. Um, oh, I'm afraid I've gone, oh. I've lost my cursor for some reason, and now I'm having trouble getting back. Let me see. That is, so how, why have I lost my cursor? Okay, if we can pause it, Paul, while I try and sort out this difficulty. Thanks, Paul. Um, so when I first came here in 1985, one of the popular questions people would ask me at dinner parties is, when's a good time to go to Ireland? When is the summer? And my answer was, which it was at that time, was that summer in Ireland was one sunny Sunday in May. We just never knew which of the Sundays. <laughs> now, with global warming, unfortunately, it has got better. And before I left, there were no such thing as patios. Nobody had a barbecue. I don't think I'd ever had barbecued food almost before I left. And now everybody has patios and barbecues. So you can you take your chances, basically, when you go in the summer. Um, and a lot of the time, you will get sunny weather. But again, if you choose to do a walking or a biking holiday, be warned, you'll get rain. And But if you go between the end of May and the end of September, Air Canada, and I can't remember now whether it's Jazz or Rouge, but they now do a direct Vancouver Dublin flight, which I love. And it's an overnight flight. Otherwise, I've gone through, I've used BEA or BA and gone through Heathrow. I one that I love and I've done twice is I've used Air France, gone to Paris, stayed two nights in this fabulous, inexpensive hotel in I think it's the 14th arrondissement. And I've taken two days in Paris before flying on to Dublin. I've gone through Amsterdam. I happen to have friends in Holland. And I've gone through Frankfurt with Lufthansa. And so if any of you ever do choose the Air France, please contact me. And I'd be very happy to share information on the, the little hotel I stay in. And once you get there, um, I would say if you're, you know, if you're starting in Dublin straight off, I wouldn't rent a car because you're only going to pay horrendous rates to have to park it in the city and you don't need a car in the city. And anyway, what I do now is I am, um, I'm either picked up at the airport, obviously, or if I'm, if friends are coming with me, we'll take just one of the coaches into the city. And then when we're ready to go across country, I'll rent in the city from Avis and the rates are much better than renting at the airport. And then to cross the, um, the country, I highly recommend, if you can, to do it by train. And this is um, a map of the, and since I've lost my cursor, I'm not going to be able to point things out here, which is, I don't know how that happened. Um, so you, you will start in, um, in Dublin, usually, and other than the route that goes north along the east coast and over to Sligo, 
if you go any of the others, west or south, they sort of interconnect. So you could head off west and come back to Atlone and then pick it up and go. You could head to Mayo, which is Balna and Westport, then come back to Atlone, head to Galway, um, and then come back and head to Limerick. And one of the years I went on my own, I didn't rent a car and I crisscrossed the country. I went first to Sligo, came back, then went out to Mayo, went on to Galway, came back and then went south. And since I told you the country is, you know, eight hours at longest south to north, none of them are overnight trains. So and you do get an hour longer sunshine in the summer in Ireland. And so you get to see the countryside, which is fantastic and to read or do what you want while you're crossing the country by train. So I highly recommend that as a way of travel. Whoops. Um, so that's how to get around. And then I'll come on when I talk about Dublin in specific, about how you can get around locally in Dublin with buses and the Dublin area rapid transit, which is the dark. I mentioned the walking or biking holidays. Um, watch out for the weather and the watch out for bicycle molecules. If anybody's a Flann O'Brien fan, in the 1950s, he wrote a, uh, a book called The Third Policeman, which is a hilarious book. Um, and his thesis was that since the policeman and the postman spent all of their life on bicycles, they became half bicycle and the bicycle became half them. So um, if you're looking for, for a, an Irish read out of the ordinary, and finally, I've never done any of these, but you can do a boating along the Shannon, which is our longest river. You can boat on the canals, and there are two canals that um, drain into the sea. We call it the sea in Ireland, in Dublin. Uh, I think it's the Royal and the Grand. Um, and again, if you go online routing around, you'll find out how to rent barges on the canals or the Shannon. And you could do, for those of you who are sailors, before I ever left Ireland in the early 80s, I, I'm not a sailor myself, but a lot of my friends were. And I went on an eight day around the Southwest sailing trip, um, thanks to one of my friends who knew how to charter it, etc. OK, so that was the trains. OK, before we go any further, um, I'm going to introduce you to just a little bit of our language. So there are six Celtic languages. Uh, and of which two of them are Gaelic, Irish Gaelic and Scots Gaelic. And um, in the old days, when I started in elementary school, the, we even had our own lettering. So there was no H in the Irish lettering and it looked completely different. So my name on my birth cert is N-I-A-M with this big dot over the M, which is called a bulsha. Um, because there was no H when I was born. So um, that's that was the original spelling of my name, but now we then anglicized our lettering at least. And so our country is actually called Era. And you'll see that there's a fada, which is the, the um, accent. Um, we put a fada on some of our, our vowels and that tells us how to pronounce them. There are still parts of the country that are completely uh, in Irish. So, and you know when you've hit it because the road signs will suddenly change and Irish will be at the top and English underneath. If you stop to go into a pub or, or a shop, everybody will be talking in Irish. And they're called Gaeltacht, which are areas that um, speak Irish. And all of us who grew up in Ireland were sent there for a month at some stage in our youth in, in a form of Irish immersion. And mine was in Connemara, hence partly the attraction to there for me. And um, any of you who have followed the Oscars and the foreign language films, um, there, and it's playing now at the park, there is the first ever Irish language film to make it off the, to make it successfully at the box office off the island. It's called On Colleen Kuhn, which translates as The Quiet Girl. And if you go to see it at the park, it's all in Irish and has subtitles. Um, and so also in our language. So my name is Neve Kelly. In Irish, it's Neve Nee Kelly because Nee is daughter of. So I am Neve, daughter of Kelly. My brother, whose name is Connor, the Irish of which is Crahur, which, yeah, you certainly couldn't get out of that spelling. But he's Crahur O Kelly because he is Connor, son of Kelly. And also if you... Um, may or may not remember when I did a little bit of the kings and queens in the mythology, 
some of our famous, um, like Finn Mac Cool, and there was a Mac Nessa. Mac is son of from the matrilineal line. So O'Shelly is Connor is son of Kelly, which was my father, but Mac Nessa would be a son of from the matrilineal line. Hence the popularity of so many O surnames in Ireland and Mac surnames. And finally, just a little bit of, um, we are a completely Catholic infused country. And so our greetings, um, this uh, dia, it's dia which mean is our way of saying hello. So if I met you, I'd say dia which, which means may God, dia is God in Irish, may God be with you. And then there's this banter goes on. And so then the next person would say, oh, dia smurigich, which is may God and Mary be with you, because of course the Virgin Mary is all holy in the Catholic church. And then if there's somebody else there, they might say August Leporic. And then they start going down the saint's line with Porik being, of course, top of the saint's line. That's how you greet. If somebody's leaving, you say Slán, which is goodbye. And if they're going home, you say Slán Awalia. And if you are raising your pint in the pub, you say Slánche, which is to your health. Slánche Wa. It Wa is good. Good health. And again, if any of you watched the Oscars, there was, I think, in either the sound or video or visuals, I can't remember which movie he was on, but there was an Irish guy who got up and as soon as he had his Oscar in hand, he said, Gura Mahagat, which is the Irish for thank you. Okay, so we're, oh, now I'm going to take you to my favorite part of the country, which is the West Coast. And I mainly hang out in an area of Galway that is called Connemara and also Mayo. So the next series of slides will be um, from my rambles around that countryside. And um, the lighting, I don't know, the lighting comes in quite, so, so basically when you're in that part of the country, you're skirting the Atlantic Ocean all the time. So what I do when I go hiking with friends, and this is the great thing with these discovery maps. In, in Ireland, when you hike, you don't hike always along predetermined routes. You basically, you know, go out your, the door, like my friend happens to have a place halfway up the mountains, and you just start hiking up the mountain. And you use the map to see where you're going. But it's not always paths that are, that are cut out for you. And we usually end with a dip in the Atlantic Ocean, which no matter how warm you've got on your hike will definitely cool you off. So, you know, the, the lighting and the wind is beautiful in this part of the country. So these are all from Mayo and Connemara in the west of Ireland and um, quite typical of the scenery here. Again, you can see it's always the interplay of mountains, of stones. And in the west of Ireland, it's very much bogland and heathland, which I just love. And um, at water, it's always water. And here you can see in this one that, you know, some of the coloration of the stones there as the water comes down. This I love. This is a river. This isn't even the sea. And you can see all the sort of seaweed. And again, you know, always the the um, animals roaming free, the the sheep. I don't, you might have seen, I don't know whether in an earlier one or later one, you, you'll see markings on the sheep. And because they roam free, so you'll see red markings, blue markings. That's how the farmers denote, which is their flock. And again, this is um, this is in Mayo, looking down on some of the lakes. Okay, so where to stay? Um, so again, I've got a whole section on Dublin. And I don't know where my phone is because I, oops. Okay, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Okay. Um, but even when you go out in the countryside, I would highly recommend Airbnbs. And that's where I tend to book when I'm bringing friends over. And you can get Airbnbs literally in the middle of nowhere. For instance, I'm going to show you the one I stayed at in Connemara a few years ago when I brought a friend over. It was a mile walk to the nearest pub. And obviously, if I was going to drink, I had a walk. So, um, and it was, a, uh, I think that one was 140 Canadian dollars a night for two bedrooms and two bathrooms. And if otherwise, some like when I went to Wicklow, one of the times I was there, I just wanted to stay two nights. So I stayed in a bed and breakfast, a tiny bedroom, you know, if you're lucky on suite, but as little as $60, $60 a night. And again, if you go to um, the, uh, oh, I can't go now because my cursor. Oh, I don't know how I can do that. And I don't know why I've lost my cursor. So 
Um, anyway, the, the URL is there. If you go to Ireland.com, um, they have a whole section on accommodations and you'd be able to look at bed and breakfast. And obviously, if you go to Airbnb, you can begin to narrow in on different parts of Ireland and see what's available. And this is the house in the middle of nowhere in Connemara that we stayed in. And you can see the mountains behind it. It uh, was quite isolated. This is a more up close of it. This is the bathroom in the house where you could um, relax in the bath and look out at the fields uh, at the same time. So pretty fantastic. Oh, yeah. And it's a mile to the pub, I said. And this pub happened to be called Kelly's Pub. So um, and I will say um, whatever you do in Ireland, make sure you go into the pubs because Ireland is all about the stories and that's where you, you know, and people have a natural curiosity because we're an island. And so a lot of people obviously have not left the island, particularly the older people. So the way that they understand other parts of the world is to ask questions when do comes into the pub. So they're, they are well worth it. This friend of mine who came with me a few years ago, we sat in a pub in Ireland, I think it was either just before the abortion referendum or the gay rights or the uh, gay marriage. And there were old men in their 70s debating it. It was quite fascinating. And um, I think in the interest, well, anyway, if, if you want to get further afield than Ireland, you can go out to some of the islands. But I'm going to skip this because um, I want to spend time in Dublin. And the other thing to mention, as well as in the pubs, where you'll definitely find some characters, there are lots of other characters that you'll meet out on the, the roads. Okay, about the rain, i.e. when to go. Well, I think I touched on that. It always rains. And just like the Eskimos with snow, we can carry on whole sort of interchanges of conversation around the rain. It lashes, it buckets, it pisses, it spits, it dribbles. And believe it or not, there's a dry rain as well as a wet rain, a soft rain, and then there's a rain that gets under your skin, which particularly if you're over by the Atlantic and it starts, you know, coming sideways, uh, you can get wet. So bring rain gear. And finally, if you do get drenched, you go into the pub to dry off and you order a hot whiskey. And of course, the ducks love the rain. OK, so now I'm going to do Dublin. And you could easily go to Ireland and make Dublin your base for most of it because you can do really interesting day trips from there. Um, so, and I have a friend who went to Ireland for her 60th with her daughter. She made Dublin as her base. She didn't rent a car there. And they did, they went up to Belfast on the train for a day. They went down to Wicklow on a bus tour, bus tour for a day. Then she took the train across to Galway and then she rented a car in Galway for three days to be able to explore some of Clare and Mayo as well, and then gave the car back and came back by train. So um, so Dublin obviously is, is a destination unto itself. It's a European city. Getting around, um, here is again the, um, this is Imrod Aaron, Irish Rail. And this is a map that shows you the interplay of the trains that come into Dublin, the um, Dublin area rapid transit, which is the green line called the DART. And it, so if you're in Dublin and you wanted to go further south of Dublin, you could go all the way to, for instance, along the way you'll see um, Sandy Cove and Glass Tool. And Sandy Cove is where there's a jo Joyce's Tower, for instance. So you could take the Dublin area rapid transit to get, or on the north side, Hoth is a fabulous walk. And when you're in the city proper, the red line is called the Lewis, and that's a tram line. So, for instance, in my case, I stay out on in Maynooth, which is out on the rail line. I come in and then I'll hop on the Lewis, the tram line, to get around the city. So that's getting around. Um, Airbnb or home exchanges are, are things you can do. One year we did a home exchange way out on the last stop on the Dart on the south, which is in Greystones. Um, and we're still, I mean, we didn't come into Dublin regularly, but um, depending where you want to stay, um, there, there is the possibility of staying further out and coming in on the Dart. And then, but if you're staying in Dublin proper, what if, again, if I'm, if I'm back on my own, I stay with my sister, but if I'm back with groups of friends, 
I tend to stay in the inner city because then you can walk everywhere. And I'll show you what that looks like in some of the places I stay. So this is a map of the inner city of Dublin. And, um, oops, I'm still trying to get that cursor to work. Um, so um, I don't suppose you can see my finger when I point, can you? No. Um, so on, in the inner city, if you look on the, um, so first of all, you'll see right down the center of it is the River Liffey. And the Liffey is what divides Dublin into the north side and the south side, sort of typical of what divides uh, an American city in, in terms of the railway tracks and the north side being uh, thought of as the, the poorer side and the south as the wealthier. And so on either side of the Liffey, if you look, um, if you see Guinness Storehouse, so the area around Guinness Storehouse is called the Liberties. And in the old days, when I grew up, all of these areas in the inner city, I wouldn't have been frequenting. They were what were called county council. They were poorer areas. But now, of course, everywhere has uh, been gentrified. So I've stayed in the last number of years when I've gone back, I've stayed in Airbnbs um, in the environs near the Guinness Storehouse. I've stayed in the environs of, if you see St. Patrick's Cathedral, I've stayed there. And then, which is on the south side of the Liffey. And on the north side, I've stayed in the area called Smithfield near Jameson Distillery. And I've stayed in the area called Stony Batter. And again, talking about the pubs, in each of these four areas, when I've stayed there, there will always be a pub within walking distance. And I'd highly recommend if you're staying there, just dropping in, there'll usually be music some night of the week. And I would, I would not warn you against, but there's an area on the map called Temple Bar, about halfway um, on the map. And it's completely a tourist area. It didn't exist when I left the country. And it's full of pubs and restaurants and everything. Some of the restaurants are great, but the pubs there and the Irish music there are much more for the tourists. Whereas if you go in the places that I mentioned where you'd be staying, you would get genuine um, music where, where local people come in of a night with their instruments, which is very typical in, in parts of Ireland. So that's where to stay. Um, and I mentioned the Liffey, the south side and the north side. And again, um, you can see uh, some of the places you might want to go. You can see Trinity College Dublin, which of course has the Book of Kells. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about the museums and galleries because they are a plus if you're staying in Dublin. Um, you can see if you want to do a whiskey tour, Jameson Distillery, the Guinness Storehouse does a big tour. And um, obviously there's lots of, of our history, St. Patrick's Cathedral, Christ Church isn't here, but a lot of the history is, <coughs> pardon me, and um, Again, pubs, even for coffee during the day. One of the oldest pubs in Ireland is called the Brazen Head. And despite it being the oldest and looking like it might be touristy, it's actually not. A lot of local people go, I go every time I'm home and it's great food at a great price. Again, depending on what you want to do in Dublin, you could do history tours, which um, a lot of them will start at the, the general post office, which is where our famous rebellion of 1916 happened. That was the start of our push for independence. Um, there's bookstores all along the quays of the Liffey, um, which I always frequent when I'm home. You can do riders, riders walking tours. And any of these tours, you could set up yourself having gone to the tourist office, or you could do organized tours. And then for shopping, on the south side of the city, there's Grafton Street and the side streets around there. And on one of those streets, um, you'll it'll be very easy to find. There's a huge two or three level store that almost takes up a full block called Kilkenny Design. And that's a great place to see the full range of all of Irish arts and crafts, pottery, textiles, obviously liter literature, art, everything. But the big plus in Dublin is all of our museums and art galleries are free. So... What I do when I'm in Dublin, any day I'm going in, I'll set up to meet a friend for lunch or coffee. 
And I go in an hour, an hour and a half earlier, and I'll drop into either the National Gallery, where, of course, it's it's a European gallery. So you've all the European masters and you've got the Irish artist and for instance, um, W.B. Yeats, the poet, his brother Jack B. was a well-known Irish artist. Then for modern art, there's the Hugh Lane Gallery, which is on the north side of the city. And it's got great modern works, including Rodin. And it has a whole room devoted to um, Sean Scully, who's a very, I think Sean's probably in his 70s now. He's, I think he's America-based, where he was bo I, born in New York. And he's sort of, um, it does modern art in the vein of Rothko. And I, I just love his art and there's a whole room in the Hugh Lane. And again, as I say, you decide you're going into town and you drop in for an hour, an hour and a half and you've had enough and you leave because they're free. The National Museum of Ireland is Ireland's national or natural history museum. And then there's some hidden treasures in the in the basement of the National Library. There is a full room devoted to Yeats. And in the center of it, it has this open rotunda, which on a cycle has um, famous Irish people reading some of his poetry. I think it's on about a 20 minute cycle. And you have Sinead O'Connor reading No Second Troy, which is just amazing to hear. And then in, um, in College Green, which is the area around Trinity College, there's a huge bank there. And um, they now have a Seamus Heaney exhibit. Um, thankfully, it happened to be only a few years before he died prematurely. But Seamus Heaney realized, obviously with his Nobel Prize and his teaching at Harvard, that if he didn't decide where all of his... Um, his work was to be housed and um, he didn't know where we go. So he literally apparently phoned up the National Museum and said, I want I want it to belong to you. And they said, brilliant, we, we'll find a place to house it. And then he put it all in his car and he drove it to them. And so you can see this in, in uh, College Green. And what's fantastic is you see his original manuscripts with his chicken scratches where he's deciding to change a word here or there. Highly recommend that. And then there is one museum that's a private museum that I would recommend. I think it's about 20 or 25 euro and it's called Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum. And, and it's a multimedia, multimodal. And I, I take about two hours to go through it every time I'm home and I still go. And I'm not going to wait. The, the last bit is just to say there are museums all around the country and again, free. And then if you want to do day trips outside of the city, having based yourself in Dublin, on the north side, there's Hoth Head. And again, you can get to it on the dark, the Dublin area rapid transit. And it's brilliant for hikes. And it's a seaside town, fabulous fish. And um, if you go south side, there's Dorky and Kalini. And I mentioned Joyce's tar, Tower. You can do day trips to Wicklow. And um, unfortunately, as I say, I can't link in now. But as well as the beauty of the countryside, there's a famous um, monastic site, Glendalock. Um, which has a whole sort of Christian history to it. You can go to Belfast for a day. Lots of my friends and family, and when they want to go to Belfast, they'll just go up for the day on the train. They'll go to, there's a fabulous Titanic museum because the Titanic was built in Belfast. So they'll go up for the day, take in the Titanic museum, and then come back. And finally, unfortunately, again, I can't bring you to it, but um, I would, now I'm a cemetery person, and um so on the side, if any of you ever go to Paris, there's a fabulous cemetery, about 50 minutes by subway or whatever, uh, metro uh, called Père Lachey. But in Ireland, there is this big cemetery on the north side called Glass Nevin. And it's where all of our history is, is there. Um, Michael Collins, if you saw the movie, um, all of our, you know, all, I think most of them who took part in the rising, all of our history, and they do fantastic tours there. It's well worth uh, going online beforehand, booking your tour and going, and they'll take you around all the grave sites of our, our famous heroes. And um, as I say, it's steeped in history, and I'd highly recommend that. And that's accessible on, I think it's on the Dart, I'm pretty sure. Okay, and finally, I talked about um, characters uh, roaming around the country. Well, there's just as many characters in the city. And so for the millennial, there were um, commissions given to a variety of artists to do bronze and other statues. 
But the Irish are irreverent and our humor is irreverent. So this is in honor of the Liffey and it's called Anna Livia, but she's actually called the Floozy in the Jacuzzi. This is Molly Malone, who I'm sure you've heard the song, but she's actually called the Tart with the Cart. This is um, an ode to local women and it's to, it's in a, um, a shopping district, not a shopping mall, a street shopping right in the center of the city where the women, and it's not far from, there's open market um, and fruit and vegetable markets. And it's where the women would have come to do their shopping. So it's just two local Irish women. And that's the hags with the bags, of course, not the official name. This one, I'm going to leave it up to you to work out what the Irish would call it. Um, that's Oscar with the Lear. And um, I'm going to end with a postscript by, of course, my favorite Irish poet and tell you that sometime make the time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October when the wind and the light are working off each other so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter and inland among stones the surface of a slate grey lake is lit by the earthed lightning of a flock of swans, their feathers roughed and ruffling, white on white, their fully grown headstrong looking heads tucked or cresting or busy underwater. Unless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly, you are neither here nor there, a hurry through which known and strange things pass as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. Thank you. Now, I don't know. Paul, I'm wondering if you can stop my share because my cursor isn't working for me to go up and stop it. Oh, I'll do escape. And let's see. Okay. Let me see. stop participant sharing. I've stopped your oh, share. Stop. That's all I... So first of all, Neve, thank you for such a wonderful and enthusiastic um, presentation. It was very clear how much you love your home country. I do. Thank you. And thank you also for so much practical and useful information. I'm going to open it up to uh, participants. I'm just going to change my view. If I can do that. So I can see you. And I would like to say that um, Anybody who's planning a trip in Ireland, I would be, as you, as you said, Paul, I actually, I do love my country and I would happily meet up with anybody for a cup of coffee or a pint or whatever, um, if they want to work through some of the questions as they're planning an Irish trip. So are there any questions, comments, thoughts? Helen? I'd just like to say, Neve, how much I appreciated you ending with that beautiful poem. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I can't see. Yes, uh, uh, Neve, I really enjoyed your talk. And I've never been in Ireland or never thought of visiting there. But after that talk, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got me going. It would be very interesting to, to, uh, uh, to visit the country. Lots of history and a, a beautiful, beautiful country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say thank you very much for your talk. It was wonderful. I spent two weeks traveling all over Ireland, and I understand your love for your country. It's beautiful. I think if I left BC, I'd want to live there. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll say uh, that I've been to Ireland, I guess, a couple of times, and I was in Limerick in uh, May. And it must have been a very unusual time because I had about three days of sunshine in a row. Mm -hmm. Temperature went up to about 25 degrees. And I remember walking from the university where we were along the uh, canal or river, I'm not sure which it was, into a little town. And the local people were just complaining bitterly about how hot it was. <laughs> it was not acceptable to them. Yeah. 
<laughs> One other story about that trip to Limerick. I don't like beer at all. But the only thing that we were served with our meals was Guinness. Yes. And I have to say that I actually asked for a second helping of Guinness, which was uh, a very unusual thing for me to want to do. Yeah. So Well, there's whole lore around... Um, so everybody takes their Guinness very seriously in Ireland, as you can imagine. And so people will say that the further you go from Dublin, the better it tastes. And then there's whole, I'm sure somebody's done a thesis on it. There's whole theories, whether it's as it travels in the caskets or is it the water that comes down? And there's a pub in Galway, because obviously, as I say, the West of Toronto, it's called Shawnee Noctons, um, which is the name of the owner. And in, in, in the group of people I hang out with, we sort of hang our hat that the best pint of Guinness in Ireland is in Shawnee Nocton's in Galway. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of lore around the pint. Any other comments? Yes, I, can't, I can't see everyone in one fell swoop. So if you wish to talk, just start to talk. I just wanted to thank Neve for the beautiful talk oh, as well and just say hi after a decade of not having seen her. <laughs> Tell her we're doing that. We're, we're definitely doing that coffee if you're available. That was a beautiful talk, beautiful pictures. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd love to do coffee. <laughs> this is what happens when we retire. We reconnect. Okay. There is someone in the remote site, uh, sorry, in person, you need to put your microphone on and you're muted. We need to have you unmute. Mm -hmm. Is Sandra still there with you? Sandra, yeah. can you somehow unmute her, please? It's Angela. Hello. You're unmuted now. Yeah, it's Angela. You. Yeah, it's Hi, me. Angela. George and I are out here at UBC in a beautiful room that's empty. There's nobody else here. Just us. And we'd love to have seen you here. <laughs> Hello. Neef, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. It's, it's um, always get homesick around this time of the year. I know, I know. That's why I, um, I, I offered uh, about six months ago to Paul and said, look, I'd love to give this talk as near as possible to Paddy's Day. So, yeah, I chose it. <laughs> so um, just to, to one comment, actually, I'll ask, check with George here. One comment and one question. Uh, one comment, you're talking about Guinness. And the, the last time we were with Seamus Heaney, back in, what was it, 2008? 2008 in Clonus in Monaghan. Uh, Seamus and George were drinking um, Heineken, weren't they? Yeah. Weren't you? Yeah, everybody. Yeah. It's funny, all, all the Irish poets were sitting there and none of them were drinking Guinness. They were all drinking <laughs> Heineken. And it was absolutely typical. They were all talking away there. And I was the one who had to go up to the bar and get the drinks, but it, and it was Heineken. <laughs> but I, must, I myself, I love Guinness. Oh, now, the, in Dublin, the draw for me would be in Dublin would be the, the theatres, the gaiety, right. um, the abbey, I forgot the gate. To mention those. Yeah. Uh, and it, I mean, the gaiety, the audience participation is just fantastic. People just don't sit there quietly and clap and all the rest of it. If they don't like something, they say so. And if they do like it, they, <laughs> they, we had the absolute privilege of seeing the Borstal boy there um, oh, some years so. ago. And it was um, it was the matinee. Oh, that's the other thing. You can get a seniors discount, yeah, especially yeah. How, if you have um, your Euro passport, which we have. So we got in at seniors prices, which was very nice, and it was just great fun because it was it was like we were part of the production, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, if you know anybody who's gay or queer. The bar um, to go to, which we went to by mistake because we were caught in a downpour. It was pouring. And we went into the first bar on George Street. And the George? Yeah. The we George. didn't see the Definitely. rainbow flag. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alison, thanks was... for bringing up the theatres. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, the theatre is definitely the thing to do in the evenings. Or, or the matinee, the senior matinee, matinee, like you say. No, yeah. the matinees are great. And um, if you go to the, um, and we didn't do it, did we do it at the Gaiety? You can pre order your drink. Yeah. In the, yeah. Um, which is great. So you just go out and you, you have it. So you're able to enjoy your, your drink. Yeah. Um, 
which is and really picking good. up on your point about um, what may be viewed as the irreverence of the audience. I mean, again, it makes my point. I'd say to anybody going to Ireland, the Irish like to talk. And so we, you know, there's no irreverent questioning, like, uh, you know, engage at, at no matter what um, experience or level you're at. I would say always engage the Irish because that's where you that's where you'll find out more about what the country is really about. And, and everybody has to go to the Trinity College Library, which is yes. so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was the other thing I wanted to add. We do, the Book of Kells. We've got That's a beautiful sweet. reproduction here at UBC in special collections. Oh, <coughs> thanks, Alice. You go and to the library at UBC and um, ask the librarian. And it's, I mean, I've seen the real Book of Kells when you could just wander in and have a look. We went, we hitchhiked down to Dublin when we were students and we just, you could just wander into Trinity and see the Book of Kells. It wasn't a big lineup of tourists in those days. But if you want, if you do, if you can't go to Ireland and you want to see the Book of Kells, it's a really. I'm looking around here, George. It's a really good reproduction. Yeah. We we brought our uh, we brought one of our granddaughters in so she could see the Book of Kells. Uh, it's really excellent. It's here and it's here at UBC. I think it's neglected. Nobody knows about it being there. Yeah. So there you are. I didn't know. Well, you just go to the library or ask the librarian, and I think it's in special collections. Paul, oh, can sorry. Angela and George see everybody or just Neve? No, they can't. I, I can they... see you, Helen. You I can. can see Richard. Hello. And, um, <laughs> we could, we could see Richard, everybody. Neve, Elizabeth, <laughs> Katrina, Paul. Hello, Paul. <laughs> okay. It sounds like an Irish gathering already. <laughs> most of us have got on. I can't see everyone. There are so many uh, people who joined, uh, like there were 43 participants. And I think I can only have about 25 on one screen. So I have two sections. I can only see I hope you can't see minutes. us. Yes. <laughs> we can see you now. It, what? They, they can. can. See you. Oh, my oh, God. Yes. Now we're seeing you. <laughs> we just so, rushed down here and made it time. <laughs> so how, how it works is that as soon as you start to talk, uh, the camera comes and looks straight at, and focuses on you. Mm -hmm. oh. When you're not talking, it shows the whole room. It doesn't show you. The camera will get worn out with Angela. <laughs> uh, uh, no. I don't think so. Not kind. So we have a, Any, a number of Is anybody going to Ireland? Hmm. Does well, anybody have plans? <laughs> we, Sorry, uh, does anybody have plans apart from Neef to go to yeah. Ireland? N not now, but we were there ten years ago, and we loved. I loved it. We were there together. Bob was on the board of the uh, advisors. advisors for the pharmacy faculty at Trinity. So every year they would he would came when he came for the board meeting. They would give him tickets to the long library to see the Book of Kell, so he could skip the line and just go right in and see it all. He always liked that so much. Um, I'm a medievalist, so it was always a joy, but I love the exhibition there as well, because it's not just the Book of Kells that they have there at the, at the uh, Trinity long library, library, but they have many of the other uh, manuscripts on display as well, all of which are available and digitized, but it's something special to see the real thing. We took a, uh, we actually hired a driver because we arrived and Bob was traveling so much. I was afraid he'd fall asleep driving all the time. So he could <laughs> snooze in when he needed to in the back seat. And they, it was the most expensive trip we've ever taken, by the way. Um, we drove around the, uh, um, down from Dublin, down through Wicklow. We went to the Valley of the Two Lakes there and saw the yeah. monastery, yeah. St. Kevin's Monastery um, to Cork. And um, and then around to Kinsale, which I loved. We loved Kinsale. And uh, there's so many little things to see there that are tucked out of the way. And then back up to uh, um, Kilkenny, I guess. And then we had to go back to his meeting at the end of the month. So we went all the way straight across and we didn't get to Galway. But we did see Killarney. It was... Um, uh, 
uh, a wonderful experience. And we had only one morning of rain and that was the first day and the rest was lovely. So I can highly recommend the end of August. <laughs> the lucky end of August. <laughs> Okay. Well, before we finish the meeting, uh, I should let you know that our next uh, meeting is going to be on April the 20th. And uh, Peter Dodek, who was with us, I don't know if he's left us now, he's going to be talking about Puglia and Malta. So we look forward to that as a double header kind of uh, talk that he's given. Um, and I'm still looking for someone who would volunteer to talk in May. Um, so please contact me if you want to talk about anything. If you want to talk about something, but it's short, just a short talk, I can probably talk about something else and fill out the time. But uh, I would love for somebody else to volunteer to, to present sometime in May. And that would be great. So just contact me. And again, uh, I would like again to thank uh, Neve for such a wonderful, enthusiastic talk. It's got us all excited about Ireland. So thank you, Neve. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.